what I'm going to do today is run through a very condensed Winning with Wieners workshop um, and there is a lot to get through. So I may not necessarily be covering, if you've attended one of our workshops, everything in the, the high degree of detail um, that we do in the workshops, but really importantly, uh, if you do get a chance to come along to a workshop, a lot of these uh, topics that I'll be discussing today will be explored in far greater detail. So I just wanted to, to pop that out there at, at this point. So the aim basically with, with us all with regards to our wieners is primarily to ensure that we get set 95% uh, wiener survival to one year of age. What I'd really like to do is, you know, challenge you to say, well, no, we don't necessarily want them to survive. We want them to thrive to their one year of age and we want them to go on at, at Hoggett joining and be productive and be productive throughout their life. And, and a lot of what we're going to talk about covers the impact of, of less than optimal wiener management and the impacts on the short, medium, long term, as well as um, we'll talk about some of the uh, key things that we must do to get right. So I talk about thriving and many of you will have heard the term wiener ill thrift, you know, and that's just pretty much young sheep failing to thrive when other stock classes are in satisfactory health and body condition and are doing well. And it can be one or more of the following. So and whilst it might seem a little bit of a grey area, it can be one or more of either poor growth, poor wool production quality, increased disease susceptibility, or excessive mortality in the first year. And, and obviously mortality is the most severe case of, of ill thrift that, that we see. There's often multiple concurrent causes. And we do know though, most of it is related to animal nutrition and animal husbandry. Uh, we know that other diseases do have an impact, but it is primarily related to animal management and husbandry, and our genetics have but a very small effect. This chart here, I don't want you to worry about the actual national cost, which is on the vertical axis. I want you to think about the fact that wiener ill thrift and mortality is the fourth largest cost to, to the sheep industry. That's the key information here. It's both a large cost in terms of production losses. There's also a substantial uh, prevention cost. So, um, you know, uh, by, by expending 36 million, um, there's $188 million um, worth of, of costs to the industry. So the prevention cost isn't a massive um, part of, of that um, amount. But again, the costs and the value of the industry have probably expanded since then, but I, I don't see any reason why Wiener Eel Thrift would have moved from being the fourth largest cost to our industry. So it's very, very substantial and it's something we need to consider, um, you know, in the way that we, you know, the, the amount of attention we give our wieners and the amount of attention that our, our wieners deserve. So in the short term, we can expect um, some impacts apart from the fact that there, there might be a mortality rate that's higher than acceptable within our flock, and we always want to be minimising that. We do know that ill thrift on flock productivity in the short term gives us fewer ewe lambs available for, for breeding flock replacements. So if they're suffering ill thrift, the, the affected ones, the ones that are, are ill thrifty or poor doers, you might get 50% mortality in those. But ultimately, we've got less ewe lambs to select from uh, when they come up to classing for their, um, to whether they're keepers or, or in the, uh, the culls. We've got a, we can expect a lower wool cut and that's been accounted for at 13% um, of a lighter fleece weight in merinos uh, with a reduced wool quality and mainly due to staple strength and then a reduced fertility rate in those used as maidens. We also see fewer lambs reaching target sale weight if we're selling their, their brothers as, as weathers, um, and that, that results in either increased time on farm uh, before they reach their sale weight, or a failure to meet the market specifications. So either an increase in costs or a decrease in revenue as a result there. We've also got the opportunity cost of the the animals that don't make it. So we've purchased a ram team. We've, you know, within mind that we, we're going to have sufficient rams to cover all of our breeding ewes. We've invested in genetics. Um, and so therefore the cost per unit of progeny will go up because we have less progeny. We've fed those pregnant ewes. So that's another cost to our business. 
Uh, we've got the, the negative impact on new fleece weight that results from a, a breeding you carrying a fetus through to, um, to birth and then in a lactation, so depending on, on when that, um, that young animal may or may not um, make it, that, that might be a little bit more substantial. And then we've also got the increased cost of the DSE rating of our pregnant use. So they have higher feed requirements and uh, are a great cost to the business. Also in, in the short term, we've got a, um, uh, an increased percentage when they have at their first joining, we can expect ill thrift to have an impact on the, in, on the number of dry use at their first scanning. Um, and lighter, thinner ones are going to give us a less uh, percentage of twins. And ultimately, fewer of those ewe hoggets are going to reach their target live weight by joining. And so that does result in lower fertility. This little graph here comes from New South Wales DPI's Trangy Research Station. It's lots of people have, have seen a lot of this um, information and data before. But what I'd really like to draw your attention to is the fact that at nine months, if, if you've got animals that are in a low live weight, then you can expect those to give you a decreased lifetime net reproduction rate. So light weaners at nine months are not going to be as productive as heavy weaners. And you can see that here, my little mouse doesn't seem to be wanting, I'm not sure whether you can see my mouse, but we've got the, the bottom 25% net reproduction rate in the C and D flock of 1.6 and 1. And that's lambs weaned per ewe joined from their age 2 to 6. However, the top 25% are three and a half times more productive with the number of lambs that they're producing over their lifetime at 5.6 and 4.8 lambs weaned per ewe joined. Now, what I'd also like you to do is have a look at the difference between what the actual live weight was and its relativity to the top cohort's live weight. So they're going from 28.4 in the bottom 25% of an average, past 28.8, which is in our, our average cohort, and into the top 25%, it is only 30.1 for the C flock. And the difference is a similar difference in the D flock. And what's really, really important here is that there's an opportunity to move this 25%, these younger ones, uh, these smaller ones, sorry, and move them further towards average and the top 25% and try and try and make sure that the, the lower um, ones comprise a, a smaller amount, a smaller percentage of the ewe flock, the weaner flock, sorry. And again, active ewe, weaner management in the first 12 months will really set them up for a, a lifetime of, of high net reproduction rates. In the longer term, we can expect with, with weaner real thrift a, a lower rate of genetic gain in, in all traits um, in your breeding objective. Less maiden use to select from means a greater selection pressure for the desired traits, means that you've, you've got to keep some possibly inferior animals in, and that results in a decrease in the genetic gain in your flock. So now what I want to talk about is what our current industry um, recommendations are and then we'll talk about how we can uh, go about achieving some of those and some of the tools that we've got available to us. So TWW stands for target weaning weight and we, we really need to aim for having a target weaning weight of 45% of our standard reference weight. I'll come to standard reference weight in a little minute. Um, a five week joining is really important to ensure that we have a minimum um, impact of a tail in our young weaners. Um, that's really important when it comes to things like classing, but it's also about what the proportion of um, lighter animals are within your flock. The longer the joining, the longer the tail. So a, a compact joining is really important particularly in making sure that, that, that we've just, we're minimising the number of small animals come some of these key, key times during their, their life as a weaner, um, where we're making either selection or other management decisions around them. Training lambs to eat supplementary feed prior to weaning is also critical. Um, and, and I know plenty of people have um, mastered that art during the, the drought. Uh, we call it imprint feeding. 
but it's really important to even as we go into a season now if people have got autumn lambs on the ground and plenty of pasture although I'm quite mindful that there are some areas still within New South Wales that are, are still uh, looking for some substantial rain but really important to still use this supplementary feeding um, and an imprint feeding prior to weaning as that will set those animals up for life and understanding what the feed cut is and, and what comes out of the feed cut. I'll come to that a little bit later as well. We also uh, recommend the use of best practice landmarking procedures including a full vaccination program, hygiene, pain relief etc. And importantly weaning at 14 weeks from the start of lambing and, and that's obviously with a five week uh, lambing adjoining period. We want lighter weight lambs to be managed separately and feed them to achieve that target and catch up with the higher, um, the heavier weight group. Uh, and I'll talk about splitting those into to two groups shortly. We, we really uh, recommend to, to wean onto high quality pasture where possible and or supplementary feed if necessary and, and have that as part of your standard management. Drinking water is also really important and, and shouldn't be discounted. Um, we need to be mindful that our weaners can be quite fussy around their drinking water, um, whether that be just a film of dust, whether it be the fouling of, of water. As if any of you are, are familiar with um, weaners and, and troughs, uh, I don't know why, but they do like to get in the troughs and foul the water with with faeces and, and all sorts of, um, you know, dropping food and, and um, supplementary feed into that water. And that can foul quite quickly and it is... Um, something that, that the weaners will then stand around and say, well, I don't really want to drink that and wait for someone to come and clean their trough. So understanding that the importance of that, the quality of, and the cleanliness of drinking water for weaners is critical. We also recommend ensuring good internal parasite control and that is a combination of both monitoring and effective drenching. And we'll talk a little bit about that later as well, as well as regularly monitoring weaner live weight. It was interesting, um, we had 40% not regularly weighing, routinely weighing weaners. Something which is really important in understanding what's happening within your weaners and regular monitoring of, of live weights critical. Now I just want to quickly talk and revisit what standard reference weight is and we'll talk about that now. And this is this um, feed budget table for Merino Wieners is part of your handout today. Uh, you can also get it in hard copy and I'll give you details of that uh, at the end of the presentation. But to calculate the target weaning weight for your flock, we know that the target weaning weight is 45% of the standard reference weight. And this is, this is where the question about do you know the standard reference weight of your ewes? The standard reference weight of the ewe is the average weight of your mature ewes and they're not to be pregnant, so they're to be uh, non-pregnant, bare shorn, so no fleece to be accounted for, in condition score three, and with no gut fill. Now I know that that's not always getting your breeding ewes covering all of those those four points there is possible, but I'd start with uh, some condition score three dry ewes and then work out around about the bare shorn and the gut fill accordingly. And there's certain um, you know percentages that you can use for for the gut fill, and there's also you you might un, might be able to reduce uh, take the weight off uh, according to what the fleece weight is. So the target weaning weight being 45% of the standard reference weight of your ewes, and then we use this little chart that's at the bottom here, and then we go across to 55. Um, which is an example that we'll use now. So say, say uh, our standard reference weight is 55 kilos. And then we, you can see the red line, red arrow goes across to the green line that's on the chart there. And then if you bring that um, red arrow down, you can see that the target weaning weight for a, a mob of ewes at 55 kilo standard reference weight, your target weaning weight is just shy of 25 kilos. So it's really important to understand that, that the standard reference weight isn't the weight of your sheep today because they might be pregnant and the difference between um, a five week joining period, use point of lambing, singles, twins, empty, six, five week difference in, in fetal size and age, 
gives you too much variation, which is why we, we go back to the dries. Um, weaner growth targets, once we've got our, our um, target weaning weight and we've ascertained whether we're hitting that target weaning weight at weaning time at 14 weeks, then in column A there on that chart, we can see that we've got targets to meet right through until 18 months of age. So we start at 14 weeks at 45%, 18 weeks at 46%, seven months of age at 50%, 60% of standard reference weight at 10 months, and then 80% at 18 months, which is it, they're joining as a hoggit. So that's um, just a worked example there. Obviously, if you can hit and exceed that 80% of standard reference weight at joining, you're likely to get a high rate of twins within those young ewes. This graph here is a really important chart and it, it covers three different locations and, it's, and it covers the importance of why we have that target of 45% standard reference weight as our target weaning weight. So if you have a look on the horizontal axis, over to the right, you've got 50% of target weaning a uh, standard reference weight. Um, if you have a look then right through the, the lighter they get, the higher the, um, the mortality becomes. And so we've got three locations there. We've got a South Australian trial um, undertaken by Janelle Hocking Edwards. And we've also got two sites there that Sue Hatcher from New South, formerly of New South Wales DPI had done some work on. And the, the key piece of information here is the heavier they are, the lower the, the mortality rates in that first 12 months. So that's, it's a, it doesn't matter where you are, the shape of that graph is the same. The actual death rate may be a little bit different, but the heavier they are, the better chance they've got of, of going on and making it through to their 12 months of age. So what happens and, and what do we do once we get our, our lands in and it's weaning time. What happens to them after weaning is a really important facet to understand as well. And this um, this chart here is from that work that Sue Hatcher did in the Central Tablelands and the Yass area. But really um, importantly is to understand what happens with our different groups. So we've got um, group one, which is the green line, and they um, they wean heavy and they just keep motoring along onwards and upwards, and they're, they're just charging forward. They're going great guns. Group two, which is the orange line, they wean light, but then they, they grow like mushrooms as well, and, and their trajectory is in the right direction, onwards and upwards for those. We've got group three, though, who comprised between six and 14% of those, of those mobs that were assessed that wean heavy and fail to thrive. They're a cohort that we need to, to identify and rectify some and put some management around that to rectify those weight losses. Okay, that, that might be as a result of being a shy feeder if they're being supplementary fed. It might be due to worm burden, due to stress, but it's really important that we identify those. The group in two, which are lighter, might have been the late born. They might be small singles. They might have been born in a litter size with twins or, or triplets. So through no fault of their own, they're smaller at weaning time, but they're charging forward. And then we've got the poor, poor little group of, of four, group four, who are alight at weaning time and fail to do much more. And interestingly, we, with one of our Winning with Weaners workshops that we ran a couple of years ago at Kerbin, the group there wanted to, to do some weaning, uh, to, to do some weights on the weaners. And with the use of some RFID tags, and um, Emily Pitt from Ag and Vet, they, um, they went forward and, and weighed those animals and then four weeks later weighed them again. And um, amazingly, I guess, well, probably not really, the, the, the trajectory and the, the group, the proportion of animals doing what, they, what this graph here represents was just a mirror image in that group. So we know that, that we've got animals that, that might wean well but fail to thrive and they're the ones that we really need to be working on as well as these group four. So what we'd recommend is that um, whilst you wean, four weeks later get them in again 
and understand which ones have, oh, so, sorry, I'll go back a step, wean and divide them into two mobs, the light ones, the bottom 25% and the heavy ones. If you can, um, use some, some individual ID so that you can determine which ones are uh, not performing. And then four weeks later, weigh them again and that, that's where you'll be able to, to pull group three out, the ones that have weighed a weaned high and are not performing. In terms of how much we want them to be growing and, and how much weight we want them to put on, this chart here shows us that 50 grams per head per day is an important um, target for us to aim for. And that anything that's above 50 grams per head per day, you can ex expect mortality quite low, you know, in less than 10. And certainly if you can look at all of those green dots below five, that's really, really um, where you want to be sort of targeting your, your survival rates. That one back there with the post weaning growth rate of, of less than 40, it had a very high mortality rate. And it's really important that we think about 50 grams per head per day as a conservative amount that we really need uh, those young animals to be uh, gaining weight at that rate. Our at-risk weaners tend to be ones that are either showing a low weaning weight, so they might, might be those ones I talked about, the small singles, the late borns, the twins and the multiples, as well as the low post weaning growth rate ones. So that might be the shy feeders, ones that have got some disease or, or have, um, are on a bit of a pendulum of, of acidosis, so go and gorge themselves today and get a bit of a tummy ache. And so stay off their feed for a while until they feel better and then come back on. And we've got this pendulum effect here, which sees those animals not gaining any weight uh, and going backwards. Um, we also tend to see weathers are a little bit more tricky to manage and um, to get consistent growth rates out of. So uh, that's just something else to, to be aware of and it's you know, something for, for us to, to consider in, in terms of, of proactive management and separating use from, from weathers. Timely weaning is really important both for the lamb and 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 then that cohort of weaners, but also for the ewes. And I want to just quickly touch on this. Um, the recommendation is weaning at 14 weeks from the start of, of lambing and not delaying that. And if you have a look at the um, the chart here, and at the top we've got um, the the recovery at 17 weeks of of um, sorry, if we have a lactation of 14 weeks, we've got a recovery period of 17 weeks. But if we delay our weaning date um, by six weeks, so the, the orange boxes down the bottom where we can see uh, the lactation of 20 weeks, then that leaves us only with 11 weeks for recovery for, for those breeding ewes. And now if they've got the same amount of, of recovery to do, that's a difference of uh, twice the required weight gain uh, between the 11 weeks you need to recover uh, twice as fast as you do if you've got 17 weeks. And, you know, if feeds at a premium and there's, there's not a lot of um, pasture available, that can become quite costly. So the, the ad advantage of, of keeping lambs on ewes um, is all of a sudden negated. So it gives the, the weaners the opportunity to, to get going. They're not actually getting a hell of a lot of their nutrient by 14 weeks from the start of lambing. They're not getting a lot of their energy and um, uh, nutrient available from the milk uh, from the breeding ewe. But you want to really be setting those ewes up, like I said, and, and having them recover and starting that, that pregnancy and you know, um, managing them right through to ensure that they milk well to set those weaners up for a good uh, weaning period. When we talk about energy requirements, We've got both maintenance and production energy, and I don't want to dwell for too long on this, aside from saying that maintenance energy is what's required to maintain body temperature, essential body processes, i.e. breathing, digestion and movement around, and that it's affected by their life weight, what, whether they're a male or a female, what the weather's like, activity, um, how much they're moving around and what the pasture quality is. 
once we've met all of those requirements and we've got an excess of energy, that's then production energy. And that goes into the growth and the, the um, development of muscle, the production of fat, production of wool, milk and lambs. And it will only occur once we've exceeded our maintenance requirements. Why this is really important for weaners is because a lack of energy means that those weaners are going to mobilise their body reserves to maintain their body function and production. And we know because they're young animals and they're actively growing, they don't have an excess of those body reserves, which is why they're such a, a vulnerable cohort in our um, sheep flock. So if we think a little bit about what our energy requirements are, it is also really critical to think about what our crude protein requirements are because with young animals, they're putting muscle down so they have higher protein requirements. In this chart here, we've got three, or uh, four different colours and those lines represent what their growth rates are. So the green line being a maintenance, the orange line being 50 gram per head per day weight gain, um, the growth rate of 100 grams per head per day being the black line and the yellow line being 150. If you have a look, and I don't know why my mouse has disappeared, Fiona, but if, if you have a look and, and so draw a line from 12, it's right up to the green line, it tells you that you need an 11% crude protein for it not to be limiting at 12 ME. Okay, so if you've got low protein and high energy, you can be giving them as much energy as you want, but the protein is limiting your growth rate to 50 grams per head per day. So young animals need have a higher crude protein requirement and therefore I'd recommend that people get feed tests on any feedstuffs that they're feeding to their young animals, um, particularly hay and silage but also grain because it may or may not be doing its job and you, you might be finding that those weaners are, are just, just – remaining stagnant in their growth rates or looking a little bit um, uh, less fresh um, and that that quite often can be attributable to a, a lower uh, protein and in their diet and you, you need to understand that protein and energy are different nutrients that that contribute to the the growth of of those animals and address them separately and and entirely we can't we can't have all the energy in the world and inadequate protein because those animals will not grow. And we see it we see it quite often in this neck of the woods, so in central New South Wales, with spring drop lambs over the summer period when the, the, the feed's dried off uh, and if we've missed out on some rain to keep any greenery in the pasture, the weaners start to look a little bit um, how you're going and are doing a little bit less well and that's can be mitigated quite simply by either preventing it occurring in the first place by making sure that you're giving them some protein and that they're getting access to protein. And that might just be as simple as a bit of greenery in the paddock, but if there's no greenery, then you've got to supply it another way. And that's really important because a lack of protein doesn't matter how much energy you're supplying those animals. Just conscious of, of time here. I just touched then on, on the suitability of feeds for weaners. Not all feeds suitable for weaners and feeds will vary in their quality and that's why it's really important to get a feed test and make sure that the feed's going to be doing what you're expecting it to do. And importantly, if, you, if you're if you going to be getting your grain tested, the added bonus, we, we always assume that there's a certain average amount of energy in that grain, but knowing the, the, the crude protein percentage of, of that grain adds a whole lot of extra valuable information in determining whether it's suitable for, for weaners by itself or whether you've got to supplement it with something else, either some lupin, something higher protein, another, another grain or some other supplements. Monitoring weaner live weight is really important and that graph there with those four lines and those four separate groups really illustrates that well that you need to actively manage them and make sure that they're growing because by the time you see a visible change in the mob, it's too late. So that's why we say invest in a set of scales and use them. Uh, identify and regularly weigh a minimum group of 50 weaners and then use those weights to update your feed budget. Is your pasture still adequate? Do you need to change the amount of supplement or is your ME or crude protein balanced? 
So, you know, use that feed budgeting uh, tool that, that we'll, um, we'll do a little bit more on in a second, in a couple of slides. Use that to your advantage. In terms of how much green feed we need to be providing them, we really need to allocate the best pastures to our youngest animals, okay? And, and the cascade down the bottom there shows the weaners get the best, most productive pasture, hoggett ewes get the second best, and then mature ewes. That's discounting whether we've got weathers that we need to be finishing. Um, so in terms of the ewes on our pro place, that's the, the cascade and, and the priority that we would recommend that you um, give to your young animals, then your hoggets, and then your mature ewes on the third best productive pasture. The gold standard being some legume uh, by way of clover, lucerne, et cetera, is always beneficial because we know that's quite high in protein, but green feed generally has enough protein in it to, to meet the requirements of weaners. A, a feed on offer um, amount of 1,800 to 2,100 kilos of green is really important. Uh, that's green dry matter per hectare and managing pastures to, to maximise the vegetative state. So not putting them into tall rank um, and low digestibility pastures and minimising grass seed. Uh, we know how much weaners love or not like um, our grass seed and it's important to, um, to consider that when we're setting up and planning our weaning paddocks. And of course, worms being a massive a contributor to, to wean eel thrift, we really need to set our weaning paddocks up for low uh, worm burden if possible. So touching back on the feed budgeting topic that I just mentioned a little while ago, we need to know what your weaners need, what they're getting, is your pasture sufficient, do you need supplementary feed, what energy and protein levels are required by those animals, and what will they need as they grow? Will your supplement change as your weaners grow? Uh, and what energy and protein levels are needed for higher growth rates if you want to achieve those. And this is where in your handouts, um, the, um, the feed budget table, um, this is contained in the feed budget table, and I'll just show you how to use it. So on the left-hand side, we've got um, the growth targets. So we can either maintain weight, we can have 50 grams per head per day, 100 grams per head per day or 150 as our target. The next column over from that is our metabolizable energy and that's the energy contained in the feedstuffs that we're feeding. And so in this case, this feed budget table doesn't take into account pasture. And that's um, a product of the, the complexity of feed budgeting. So we will use this assuming that there's that they're not receiving anything from from the pasture, okay? And then if you go across the top to the live weight, along the live weight, and you, you see I've circled there the 25 kilo live weight, okay? Now, on the left-hand side of that sort of greater area, we've got feed requirements in grams per day and accrued protein percentage. So if you join the dots from the 25 kilos and the 100 grams per head per day with an ME of our feedstuff, so for example, barley, um, we need 770 grams per head per day with a crude protein of 13% to achieve 100 grams per head per day growth for merino weaners. And, um, and that's um, assuming that their standard reference weight is 55 kilos. Um, the dark grey areas in this chart indicate that you need higher energy and protein to achieve those growth rates. Um, so, for example, if you have a look right up the top in the maintenance, we, we don't recommend that you maintain merino weaners below 30 kilos. You want them actively growing and, and they should really be actively managed to be growing um, until 12 months of age. But you can see there at 8 um, of an ME of 8 um, megajoules of metabolizable energy per kilo, um, it's not suitable for those young animals. And that's that's the, the point that I was making before, that not all feeds are suitable for young animals and crude protein is really important in maintaining and, and getting those animals to be growing to meet your targets. Similarly, down at 150 grams per head per day weight gain, um, there's quite a, a large area grayed out there, again, because it's not meeting the requirements. So in terms of, um, Successful weaner management, 
it really comes down to planning ahead. There, there shouldn't be any surprises uh, taking place here for, for your young animals. And it, and it starts with setting them up for success and, and doing some planning. So it's, it's planning your use in terms of being um, in good conditions for it joining, joining them for that set period of time, but also setting, setting those young ones up and planning ahead for that. So imprint feed your lambs, train them to eat grain before weaning. We know that that works. Make sure though, that you've got 90% of those animals coming to the grain trail and eating the grain. Um, we all too often see them coming to a grain trail knowing that something's happening, they're chasing the feed cart, they're coming to a grain trail, but they're not actually putting their head down and eating what it is that we're offering them. So when you're imprinting them, a couple of key points, imprint them on what you plan on feeding them later in life, but also uh, make sure that when you're imprinting them that they're coming to the trail and eating. Plan to supplementary feed your weaners and certainly the lightest 20 to 25% as a routine part of your management. Pull them off, that young, that lighter 25% and manage them so that they can catch up to their cohorts that are heavier. Uh, plan to feed the whole mob if pasture quality and quantity is in, inadequate. And think about the composition of the ration. And as I've said, both energy and protein are very, very important. And the protein requirements will change. They will decrease as your animal gets older. Plan your parasite control program and you know, really make sure that you're getting that right because parasites are, are a massive um, killer of, of um, young animals and of course a full vaccination program. Uh, we know that, that weaning can be stressful but it's also a critical time in setting them up for a lifetime of production. And just on imprint feeding, this graph here has got some really like a really key message that's important and, and it was done over a um, a period of time and there were three groups of, of lambs. There were the orange line, which are the ones that uh, were the control, they were never shown the feed. Um, the black line were animals that were exposed without their mothers. And then the green line were lambs that were exposed while they were still on their mother. Okay, now on the vertical axis, axis is the wheat intake in grams per head per day. Now, Really fascinatingly is that by day five, there's plenty of like the the orange and the black lines are eating their they're eating, but they're not eating enough to meet their daily requirements, which is why imprint feeding is such an important thing to get right, so that when you do start feeding, number one, you start feeding early. You don't wait until you can see a, a decrease in in the the weights of those weaners and they're going backwards, but also it accounts for you know, some of that time for those animals to get on the feed. So animals, and interestingly, those animals that were um, imprinted with mum, 90% um, of those came to the trail. I'm just pulling out some, some actual figures here. And they were eating and it was, um, they were 34 months old. So it was, um, they hadn't, they were showed that that feed at 12 weeks of age. So it is a lifetime skill that they learn and the, the ones in the green line ate immediately. Obviously they didn't eat a hell of as, as much on day one as they did as they progressed through. But again, imprinting them and setting them up for success is really critical so that you don't lose any of those valuable days because given that they've got quite a low amount of um, body reserves, five days can be quite a significant amount of time in the life of a weaner, particularly when you're looking at production. Um, I've talked about the internal and external parasites and about how important it is to get, get your worm control right, but it's important because those young animals immune system isn't fully developed. Uh, stress does increase their susceptibility. Um, worm in, infection impairs nitrogen retention and can lower feed intake, so it's a a double whammy effect if you like, so they can be eating but they're not not um, uh, retaining the, the quality of that feed. And we also know that young animals are more susceptible to flies, so we need to incorporate that into our um, management to um, prevent uh, unnecessary fly strike. Parabos is where you're going to get the most um, up-to-date information on uh, flies, lice and worms and I won't go into to that because um, we've got too many um, different production zones, parasites etc but you, 
You can access some decision support tools there as well as management um, advice relating to husbandry, genetics and chemicals. But I'd also recommend that you speak to your trusted animal um, advisor about how to put together a, a, a program that's going to minimise the impact of, of all of those parasites on your wieners. So just in wrapping up, we've got um, key management must-dos. And um, we really need to, to think about putting these as part of our routine management. So a five-week joining period, uh, thereby avoiding a tail in the wiener mob and, and an unnecessary tail in the wieners. Early selection and management of wiener paddocks and supplementary feed those wieners. We need to set a target weaning weight and wiener live weight targets throughout that growth trajectory so that we can hit our joining weights at 18 months of age. Uh, hygienic landmarking practices to avoid any unnecessary um, effects of, of the landmarking process, make that as, as least stressful as possible, um, have the animals in and out of the, the yards um, in a, an orderly fashion, give them ample time to mother up, decreased amount of time away from mum. Again, effective imprint feeding prior to weaning and again with the feed that you'll use later on. Wean at 14 weeks from the start of lambing, a full vaccination program with a booster at weaning plus an annual booster and then another booster at high risk times. And, and we've we've heard about that at different Sheep Connect webinars in terms of when we've got um, going onto a different feed. So if they're coming out of a feedlot onto some lush pasture or going into uh, a containment area or something like that, always give them that extra booster because of the pulpy kidney risks. We need a robust internal parasite management program. Um, and that constitutes uh, regular worm testing and an effective combination drench. Uh, we also need an effective external parasite program and um, good grass seed management and control. We'd recommend that you identify and monitor a group of at least 50 um, wieners and weigh and regularly chart the progress of those so that you can see that the whole mob are meeting these growth targets that, that you've established. And again, routinely draft off the lightest 25 and manage separate if they're under the target weight. Uh, regular monitoring for general wellbeing and empathic behaviour. Like I said, water's a, a big one in terms of, of um, weaners and, and their fussiness and their fickle behaviour. Um, so don't set and forget. Spend a bit of time checking on them, taking them back and showing them, you know, whatever the, the, um, the features of the paddock are, i.e. water, where water is, um, and you know, if you've got some supplements out for them as well, putting them onto that as well. Um, regularly review and update your feed budgets. Feed budgeting is something that's, that shouldn't be a difficult part of your program, but it should be part of your standard routine management and understanding the differences that different classes of stock need, but as they grow and get bigger, it's really important. Um, early commencement of supplementary feeding to avoid weight loss. As I said earlier, once you can see them losing weight, it's too late. You've incurred that weight loss and that's going to be detrimental to hitting those targets. And again, regularly monitor all water sources for quality and quantity and biosecurity in terms of foot rot and OJD on farm. Here's a picture of the front of the Winning with the Wieners um, feed budget table and also the Wiener management checklist that are available as handouts today. If you would like these in hard copy, you can contact the AWI helpline on 1800 070 099 and they can post a hard copy out to you. But the Wiener Management Checklist's got a, um, a little magnet on the back of it, um, so you can pop that on your filing cabinet. I probably doubt whether you'd want to put it on your fridge, but uh, it might be the fridge at the wool shed or um, at the shed, uh, tea room or something like that. Um, but it gives you the opportunity to, to insert some of those key dates Put your targets there and then uh, what the key management uh, that you need to do at different times throughout the year. Um, learn some key skills. Feed budgeting, pasture assessment, condition scoring, weigh your weaners. Make them part of your routine, um, make these uh, key skills part of your routine management and attend a workshop that can assist in further gaining those skills, whether it be winning with weaners, lifetime year management, um, in Victoria, they've got weaners for profit, but continue to refine your skills in, in particularly those key areas, feed budgeting, pasture assessment, condition scoring, and as I said, weigh those weaners. So Fiona, that's the, the last of um, my slides.
and um, yeah, ready for some questions. Thanks, Megan. It was um, no small job for you to condense that information that we normally deliver in a quite a large workshop format into um, that brief webinar format today. So you've definitely provided some valuable take home messages. We've um, got some questions coming through. So um, there's still time to ask questions, everybody. So if you'd like to, you can type them into your question pane. So starting off, Megan, um, how often do you recommend weighing weaners to monitor their post weaning growth rates that you spoke about? That's a great question. And I'll answer it with a little bit of ambiguity, not intentionally trying to confuse people. We don't want to make a hell of a lot of work for people because we know that people are time poor. So on that weaner management checklist, we recommend that they're weighed at weaning time in 18 weeks, seven months, 10 months and 18 months. Um, ideally, you could weigh them with a, a higher degree of regularity than that. And particularly if, you, if your season's giving you a bit of a hard time, maybe weigh them more often than not. But again, having them off feed is another stress for them. So we've got to balance, we've got to find a, a fine sort of area of balance so that we can um, be charting their progress and seeing whether they're hitting or exceeding those, those um, weight targets without bringing them in and making too much work for people. We, we've got to make sure that it's a something that's a routine management. So at the very least, those, um, those dates there that are on that weaner management checklist is what I'd be working towards. Thanks, Megan. Um, the next question I have is, what makes a good wiener paddock? You mentioned that it's really important to prepare a good wiener paddock. What makes a good wiener paddock? Oh, that's a good question. A, a good wiener paddock to me would have um, adequate water, make sure that water supply is good. Importantly, making sure that while we're talking about water, that, that the water source be similar to what the lambs are used to. We quite often see a little bit of confusion with the young ones when they go from a paddock where they might have been lambed down to that is um, water with dams, for example, and then you put them on um, in a paddock that's got beautiful feed and troughs and, and tanks, um, and it might be bore water as opposed to surface water, and the lambs aren't aware of you know how to, to manage. So we've got to think a little bit about where the lambs have been lambed down as well when we look at a wiener paddock. But a wiener paddock to me would have reasonably, um, I'll say reasonably short, so maybe no taller than you know 20 centimetres. Um, but again, seasonal conditions. So the, the pasture being vegetative is the most important part. And the lambs obviously need to be able to see where they're going. Um, it can be a little bit, um, stressful for them if they're going into a paddock of very long feed and that they can't find their way through uh, to get back to the water and things like that. So you kind of want to make life as easy for them as possible. So feed quality and quantity is important. Again, you don't want it too short. Um, you want them to be able to, to get a good mouthful of feed every time they are like taking one, that they're, that they're not having to, to chase that feed around if it's too short. Obviously, you know, if, if your season's not going with you, you're going to have to um, supplement those animals. So again, it's, I, I don't want to be ambiguous, but again, you know, there's, there's different elements that are important there. Depending on the time of year that you're weaning and, and putting weaners into their first paddock, shelter is important as well, whether it be shelter from heat, but also shelter from cold. So thinking a little bit about the shelter, um, feed quality, quantity, watering points and thinking about mob size versus the paddock size as well. Um, not putting too few animals in a massive big paddock and then you know not being able to track them down if you want to bring them to the water or something like that. So again um, thinking about the practicalities of, of post weaning and what you're going to be looking for um, if you want to be able to round them up and bring them back to their to the watering points so that they, they get to know that. Another strategy just on, on wiener paddocks is, is if, um, and I know different people use um, different 
uh, methods, they might use some, some ewes, but they might also use some weathers as trainers to help take those young animals to watering points and, and things like that as well. So there's other ways of, of helping train those young animals and, and give them some, um, you know, some help along to, to make that, that transition a little bit easier. Thanks, Megan. That was really good advice. Thinking about where they've come from seems quite simple, but very easily overlooked. Moving on to feed budgeting tables, you mentioned that the feed budgeting tables aren't inclusive of pasture. How do you combine the information in the feed budget table with what you think you have in the paddock and then work out what to supplementary feed and who could you go to for help? Wow, that's a that's a good question and it's it's a hard question um, for people to get their, their head around, like it's a hard issue for people to get their head around. You need to understand and develop some skills in understanding how much energy is contained in the paddock. And that comes from, you could maybe do a lifetime year management course because there's a lot of feed budgeting and pasture assessment in that. Prograze does a lot of pasture assessment as well. Simply taking um, some pasture samples and getting them feed tested will tell you what's contained per kilo of dry matter in those paddocks. So. There's different ways of, of refining your skill in that area and it's really important that you do take that into account but understand and develop some benchmarks where you go, well, that's not enough for those wieners. So I, I don't want to sort of say how long's a piece of string but, but in some ways answering this question provides us with a little bit of uncertainty but certainly um, undertaking some further training to, to help um, utilise that skill. Some of the apps, the feeding apps, have also got um, the energy uh, requirement, uh, the energy contained in different types of feeds. So um, I know the lifetime you management one does. Um, also, um, the the New South Wales DPI one, I believe, has got got those figures in it as well. So understanding that and how much those animals are going to be getting from um, you know, knowing what their requirements are and then understanding how much they're getting out of that, um, that pasture. It's, it's a difficult thing to get your head around, but it's something that you can um, become a lot more proficient at, um, you know, with a little bit of that, that further training. Thanks, Megan. Looking at imprint feeding, for a really effective imprint feeding program, how many feeds should you be giving them and how often, how far apart should those feeds be? That's a good question. Um, we need to, I, I like to be conservative in this. There's some rules of thumb which go as low as three feeds. I personally, from personal experience, would prefer to see people using at least six feeds and making sure that that's over a period of weeks. Um, and you really want to make sure, like, you want them to, to come to the feed. So depending, I mean, if, if there's an abundance of grass, it's going to be really challenging and you, you're going to have to sort of work out a, a method of, of doing that imprinting there. I don't know about other people's, but I know our ewes will come to a feed cut any day of the year. Um, and, and that's just on the back of the fact that, you know, there's been some drought and they, they love a, a feed. But, you know, importantly, understanding that if, if those animals aren't going to come to, to the feed cart, then you might need to, to find a, a paddock to do the imprinting in. So, um, but yeah, I always say six feeds and you want 90% of your of the wieners coming to the trail and eating from it. Not 90% coming to the trail and playing, which is what we quite often see uh, when we're struggling with imprinting uh, our lambs. 